That's why we have. We'll tell you about that. We'll tell you about that. Yeah. There's a special. Uh, hello? Yes. Not the shooting ball. Not the shooting ball. We already did that. We good? We good? Oh, good. All right. Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to Sunday. I'm not going to use the mic because I'm sure, hope, well, hopefully a lot of you actually went to the party last night and uh, had a lot of fun at the party last night and probably have as good of a need for sunglasses as I do. Um, so, as a matter of fact, we actually have uh, one of our panelists who uh, uh, probably is uh, okay. So, uh, is uh, is a bit under the weather this morning. Uh, he he had a little too much fun, and uh, if we're lucky, we may actually get him to uh, to, to get conferenced in. I don't know how that's going to work with the mic, but um, so what was it? What was this? Uh I got a text message from Ben. It says, "I stood up. I threw up. I am lying down again." Sorry. <laughs> if we're lucky. <laughs> Into his doorway, he'll open his door. Yeah, yeah. I have to tell you, the valiant people who prepped for yesterday. We like picked two goons out of the air and said, hi, you're helping us move furniture to make all that space happen. This was fine till about two-thirds of the way through it. Well, one of the guys walked up to me and said, I just had to wash my hands. There was vomit underneath the coach. And we're like, oh, you took one for the team, dude. He's like, oh, yeah, we already had enough of that. So uh, I don't know why you guys are still drinking, but fantastic. Uh, this is John Callis. Yeah, see, now, it's, it's a security professionals have, you know, you have to test the equipment, this expensive $85,000 intrusion prevention device that they get, so you have to try these things, right? So we had a beer opener, we had to, you know. <laughs> Not a good excuse, officer? Use your mic. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is John Callis. John is the CTO, CSO of uh, PGP. Uh, he's one of the, uh, the grumpier crypto people. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but, not <laughs> but not quite as grumpy as Rodney Thayer. Uh, Rodney's an independent consultant uh, who's been yelling and screaming about crypto and, and pretty much anything he can talk about for, for years and years and years. Uh, so w we want to have this uh, really great discru uh, discussion this morning about um, some of these revolving questions. Sorry the, the screen's not working over there. But uh, so uh, please ask a lot of questions. And uh, gentlemen. Thanks. Like, like Freshman said, we want this to be actually illuminated. Um, we want it to be illuminating. There we go. The timing on the light. There, there we right. go. Cool. <laughs> so we, 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 we want to, I, I like panel discussions to be discussions more than anything else and not be several small presentations that are, are all inadequate in their own way. So um, um, it is a discussion and please speak up and we'll, we'll, we'll hand mics around or repeat the questions as necessary. So, and um, we, uh, these questions are meant to sort of you know, incite right, riots or right. whatever. These, 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 are, these are suggested questions that we came up with. So um, we'll, we'll start with, with whatever we want to start with. All right. Um, What's up on the screen right now? I'm going to pick that one. Is SHA-1 oh, yeah. broken? So for the starters of is SHA-1 broken, the answer really is maybe. Despite the fact that, that some really brilliant cryptographers have found problems with it, what they've really done so far is that they've shown how you can take a starting, what's called an image, and diverge it in two directions and make it so that those two directions will collide in the hash, meaning that they will hash the same number. But nobody's ever found a single real collision. You know, two things start with something and find something else that will collide to it without modifying it, or finding a starting image, as it's called, and come up with a resultant hash. And that's like zero of them. So despite the fact that we're all kind of a little worried about SHA-1, and I have, in fact, said, you know, walk, do not run to the exit. You know, it really is walk, do not run to the exit. If, you, if you're starting a new project, use SHA-256, use SHA-512, use Whirlpool. 
Um, but if you, you're already using SHA-1, it's, it very well might be okay still. It depends an awful lot on what you're using it for, and that's you know, the sort of thing that, that there is no one answer to. You got anything you want to say? Uh, the only thing I would add is that uh, the SHA-1 is broken thing may in fact just be a conspiracy because when you convince your customers to use SHA-512, you get to out all the lazy Java programmers who haven't updated the JCE yet and can't do a modern SHA. Um, so there's, this actually is interesting. We've got technology issues where people, you know, they built enough crypto into their products so they could IPO the company back during the dot-com boom and then they stopped. Um, so yeah, you actually get people trying, SHA-512 requires new code. Uh, relatively new code, uh, three years, four years ago? Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Um, so, you know, complete with cycles and stuff. Um, I guess the other thing is that we, we're schizophrenic about watching cryptographers tell us when things might be broken. We had this whole thing about Doberton back in 98, 99, yeah. something like that, which had snarky comments in the papers about, like, SHA-1 structurally related. And nobody cared back then, but we care now. I um, wonder if we'd care if the Chinese hadn't been the people no, it, 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 would, it would be just fine. It would be just fine, yes. All right. So. All right, what does stegon one other one of my favorite ones, what does steganography do for me? My, my opinion is that steganography is in general something that you should avoid, and there are several reasons for it. One is that it really genuinely is security through obscurity. I mean, you know, you are hiding a message somewhere else, and if somebody finds out where the message is, it's like having a standard way to put the key under the mat. And of course, no, no, no attacker would ever look that up and find out where you've put things. So inherently, you are already working at, you're working with the problem that it is very easy to design a system that is so hard to break that you can't personally break it. It's very hard to design a system so that no one can break it, and in general, the way that we design systems that no one can break is by letting lots of people try to break them, and eventually we say, hmm, maybe I guess it's okay. And inherently, if you're doing steganography, you're not in that camp. It, is, you know, it isn't cryptography, it's something else. Related to that, there are, there are some things that people call deniable encryption. And, and this gets into an interesting other territory. I mean, for example, TrueCrypt has a thing that they call a deniable drive. And the idea would be that, you know, if you are trying to get into the Sudan and they stop you at the border, that you could show them one encrypted disk image and that would have some things, but you wouldn't show them the other one. Of course, all of this has the problem that it works best against people who are really rather nice in general. If, if, you're, if you're dealing with the sort of attacker who's merely willing to just beat it out of you or, or just give you cement shoes anyway, then, then this isn't an effective mechanism. So ironically, these sorts of things work best in civilized countries and worst where you need them the most. And there's the added problem of how do you, how do you demonstrate to the person who, will, who says, okay, you must have another encrypted thing there, that no, no, this is really the last one, or, or I don't have any of them. And then, so, you know, it depends on what your threat model is, as, as is always the answer to most crypto questions. Let's see. Comment. Uh, how about biometrics and crypto? Biometrics and crypto. Uh, Bio biometrics and crypto frequently do not get along very well. The question was, do how about biometrics? Do not play nicely together. The, 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 the reason is that all biometrics really are take a picture of something or several pictures as a base and then take another picture and compare it to them and see if it's close enough. Any cryptographic or even simple password authentication that you're going to do is a definite answer. You know, it's like, did you, did you type the word password or not? Is this really your dog's name? Um, you know, it, if you are doing biometrics, you're getting a maybe yes or maybe no. And since there is no definite answer, you, it's very difficult to use that to derive some crypto. So all of the systems that are using biometrics and crypto are really using a biometric system that will then unlock something. And it really is a trusted computing base where you have a piece of code that says, was that a one or was that a zero coming in? You know, yes or no, and ah, then I will use this key. 
there, there, there are lots of places where biometrics work really well and lots of areas where, where they do not work very well. Um, networks being where they don't work very well. You know, in, you, know you, you wouldn't want choice point to lose five million fingerprints. You know, yeah, you don't want to revoke your left index fingers. fingers. And the other thing is that they're, they're computers. There may be hardened devices and they may be wonderfully built, but they're still computers. So at some point, some hacker somewhere is going to figure out how to open up a fingerprint scanner far enough to read the signal that came off of the little scanner thing. And you won't even need Jello. Yes? Okay. Can governments crack crypto? Now, you want to start or will I? Or uh, are we talking about governments we think are our friends or governments we think are not our friends? I, I'll say any of them. Any of them. Okay. Any, well, no know, selection. Ma major, That's yeah. fine. Ma I major major governments. Okay. Including things like the mafia and, you know, Visa and major oil companies. You know, they're all governments. Scientologists. Yeah. All those major organizations. Yeah. That, all those nation states that have yeah. the resources to crack crypto, maybe. Can they? Why not? Is that you was asking? Um, well, one of I suppose the real answer is we don't know. Now, now we can make intelligent guesses. I mean, one one reasonable assumption that you can make is that governments cannot break the laws of physics. I mean, seems reasonable. If they can, then you know all bets are off, and you know maybe they're just getting things from the space aliens. But, but you know, if you want to start with the assumption of, of are they, are they going, are they go, can they break the laws of physics, you assume that they can't. So we can make some reasonable assumptions thereon. Um, people don't really grok exponentiation very well, and that's all of us. So if you, if you say, for example, they can't beat the speed of light, and say that's a reasonable assumption, and we could actually look at 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 is that assumption false later. But if you say they can't beat beat the speed of light, as an example, I I did some math for this. If you covered the entire Earth with blades of grass, it works out to about two to the sixty fourth. And um, if you then say you know let's assume that every one of these little blades of grass covering the entire Earth is a computer, well, how fast do they run? And if they could do one key check, say, like, a billion per second, that's another 30 bits. So we're out to, like, 90-some bits. And if you, you know, you, you, you do these things where you say, let's come up with something, it is almost certainly impossible to break a 128-bit key, which is what lots of us who are cryptographers have said, this is the threshold we want to, to, to pick as our minimum. And the reason we picked 128 was, was the real threshold is right now between like 90 and 100, and so we moved out to the nearest convenient power of two. Yeah, that, that well, sounds like it broke his passphrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the comment was that they, yeah. there was some Al Qaeda official, who, you know, was or is it with with PGP data. Sure, sure. Well, but yeah, but that's that's the thing about you know, do people can people break crypto? Well, can governments break crypto? Maybe, you know, can they buy pornographically yeah. expensive forensic gear to figure out the last passphrase you typed in six months ago in this so computer? Probably. How how governments how governments do break crypto is that they actually break your passphrase, and. And cause, because that is the weak link in whatever you do. There are some extraordinarily bright people who are making systems that you can buy for this. Elcomsoft, who, which is Dmitry Sklirov's company, makes a distributed password cracker. Access Data makes one. Um, um, there, are, there are a couple of other people who make them. And I, and I know that, for example, the US government has their own supercomputer that is made up of discarded PCs. So, you know, you know, geeks aren't the only people who use Beowulf clusters. That that what they will do is they will go and they will crack things. Now, what access data does, which is really cool, is that if they need to crack something, they will take the disk and they will essentially run strings, the Unix command strings. They'll go look for strings on your disk and they'll try every one of them as a potential passphrase. And about 50-ish percent of the time, they'll get you. And the reason that they get you is that most people, in fact, do not use their passphrase only 
for locking their key. And if you, if you know, if you've been surfing the web and you went to the ESPN site, you know, a, a statement about the quality of your favorite football team would not be a good passphrase because, because, because they have, in fact, you know, models that they will use to construct things that if they see what your surfing habits are, they do other things, that they will construct hypothetical passphrases. But, but flat out, about half the time, it's just lying there on the disk. Now, one of the things that, that, that I'm looking at right now as a potential project to do would be to make a tool that would, in fact, do this and would alert you if your passphrase, you could type in, you know, okay, so here's my passphrase. Could you go check my disk to see if it's lying around somewhere and get back to me in several hours? And, that, you know, that's something that, that would be a really nice tool for somebody to make. So, so the way that they're cracking things is, in fact, that they are attacking the person. They're not attacking the crypto. There, there, you know, there, there are, there are, there are all sorts of ways. I mean, humans are always the strongest and weakest link of any security system. Uh, he said that that the FBI has has suckered people to come to the to come to the United States for ostensible job interviews and and so on. I mean, that that is a standard technique that governments will in fact use if they want to arrest you and you're not in their jurisdiction. Is that they will they will dangle bait in front of you? The key logging. The key logging. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. The, the comment was that, that they, they, they convinced him to log into his machine back in Russia and had a key logger on that machine. So it sounds like the best practices for personal securities are know the individual passphrase, don't use it for anything else, and look for key logging. Any other good practices along those lines? I, I think that the safest thing that you can do, if you, you know, if you have a nation state after you, you have a huge problem. <laughs> <laughs> And, and despite the fact that, that, that I make really good crypto, I can't help you because you need good, you need good operational security as well as that. It, the best thing that you can do that's really cheap is buy a laptop and a safe. And when the, when the laptop isn't in your hands, it is in the safe because a safe makes a really good tamper evidence seal. Um, yes. Yeah. You can give something up after a few hours. Cheap comment was that, that if you had you know you have things that you can give up and you know and say two sets of passphrases. Now of course the problem with that, as I said before, is how do you convince them that that you know oh I only had two of these and not the third. Yeah, make sure ten percent of the it's ten percent of your good wares that but, you keep under this other key. Yeah. But but you know, there was a question in the back. I, I didn't see I didn't Dan see Kaminsky's talk. Uh, they asked if it, they asked if we'd seen Dan Kaminsky's talk. So, so what could someone summarize? Yeah. yeah. Anyone? Bueller. Passwords are over. Uh, no, he he implied that you could exchange uh, a bunch of hash for people's names, and the problem there is that he's forgetting that not everyone remembers names. Not yeah. He was talking about exchanging names for hex numbers for names and Yeah, this is the Yeah, so the real spec sure. I would say is go to a passphrase longer than the state of the art of password crackers. So sure. you know get the hottest yeah. machine you can, run John um, the Ripper and take three more digits, you know. Um yeah, the, that I mean Passphrases will always be with us, and that you know that, and and the reason is they're easy, they're cheap. I mean, it, if you memorized what, what your 1024-bit RSA what, key, what and one of PGP the things key. that we have found out is, in fact, that if you start putting password rules on people, they game the system, and 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 there are very good reasons, like the fact that they'll forget them. I mean, you know, that that. A good password management scheme is, in fact, write it on a post-it and stick the post-it in your wallet. The only problem with the put with, with the ha ha ha, you know, it's sitting on the monitor, is that it's on the monitor. Um, 
Um, because if you if you make people do long passphrases, they will they they will do things like add a's at the end of things. If you make them put in an uppercase character, that will be the first one. If you make them put a digit in, that will be the first the, the last one. So what you will find out is in fact that the password becomes capital P password zero or one, and then you know and then one one. Or else their corporate VPN account will have 12 words, and so, so will their account for their, you know, dogs, my pace, MySpace page. Yeah. Yes. That, uh, that, uh, the, 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 the yep. Sure. Yep. You do um, your key management rant, then I'll do my key management yeah. rant. Yeah. Um, so one, yeah. One comment was that key management is the hard problem, and and that that what you want to do is to have a password unlock the key that unlocks things. Good crypto systems today do that. I mean, PGP does that. Um, you know, a any of the ones that, that that are good systems today will do that. I mean, PKCS7 does that, so you know, SMIME and others, they will all do that as well, where, where they will in fact have cascading keys, and what you're doing is only unlocking the first one that will un then unlock others. I guess the, the other thing about key management is you know, it's hard to do good, key to s it's hard to sell good key management when you're busy trying to make money in the RSA patent, and so we get, went through a whole bunch of time where you know, greed versus technology was doing strange things to us, and and I think that you know public key cryptography and key management may or may not be as hard as we think they are. They're hard with the tools we have today, and it seems to be getting better. Um, you know, like the stuff PGP does now, but uh, it's been painful. I think it's been more painful than the state of the art was necessary. You know, if, we, if it would, if our lives had depended on it, we would have had be better key management. You know, technologies, multiple ones. You had. Um, that way you only have to remember one large passphrase that, and then you have all your other keys inside. The, the question is, is there, is there any movement to doing a standardized password vault that would store things? I don't know of anybody who has a, a cross-platform one. I mean, there are plenty of people who make them for various systems. I mean, Schneier's made one for Windows for years. The one that is built into, I into Mac OS is a completely acceptable one, except for the fact that what unlocks it is the, is the password that unlocks your account. Um, um, you know that is the weak point of that system, but I don't know of of one that is a cross-platform password lock because you would want it to to tie into lots of the parts of the system. Uh, in the back, and then back to you. Yes. Okay. But yes, he said he said he said that you can change it to something to something else. That th we, you know, which is very nice. The problem then is that none of us do. I guess the other thing is people think that some of these combined authentication schemes, the confederation I mean, stuff and the single I mean, sign on that is, is a replacement for a password vault. I mean, this is the Which problem. I don't think it is. This is the problem that we have with security is that we'll go and we'll build something good and then people will beg us to 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 make it easy. I mean I mean for you example You want Kerberized access to your phone. I mean, don't for you? example, I, I did I, I, I've done full disk encryption. And one of the, the advantages of full disk encryption is that it solves the, the I left my laptop in a taxi cab and it had 22 million customer names and now I'm going to be embarrassed problem. Uh, but it also solves the access data, I'm going to grovel over your disk and find every, every ASCII string that happens to be on it and try that as, as a way to pry open the rest of the system. Those are really the two things that it does very well. Now the problem with this is that after you build it so that someone has essentially a boot passphrase and then a login passphrase is that they will ask you, can you tie those in together? And you know, and, and being a good vendor, the answer has to be, why certainly we will. 
and you know but but you know you can do it the other way but 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 again you know once you make it be once you make something be secure people will then ask you to make it be easy because humans need things that they can use another one in the back I I have looked at the new Seagate crypto drive um, the Seagate guys are doing some amazingly cool stuff that they are not only encrypting the drive but they're actually making the disk drive be essentially a, an itty bitty HSM so which is incredibly cool now I will also say everybody else is going to be doing this because this is a project coming out of the trusted computing group and so there are standards for how to do this so you know you know while they are the first ones to market um, um, it it is very nice Today, the biggest problem with all hardware encrypting drives, whether they're the Seagate ones, little flash drives you get, and so on, is that they're all using ECB mode, which is one of the questions circling by here. You know, like, why are, why are chaining mode? Why do we have chaining modes? Now, ECB mode is electronic code book. And what you do is you take the key and you encrypt a block, and you use the key on every different block. I mean, you know, every block is done with the same key. The problem with this is that if you have two blocks that are the same in plain text, they will be the same in ciphertext. If you go to Wikipedia, which which is not good for some things, but you know is really good if you're asking it questions about math or anime, um, um, <laughs> um, um, there you know look up modes of operation there, and there is a picture of Tux encrypted in plain text, encrypted with ECB mode, and encrypted with another mode. And you can still tell, encrypted with ECB mode, that it is a picture of a penguin. Now that is a re that that is because it is essentially a low-color posterized thing, and so you can still see the patterns in it. The reason that they're doing it that way is that the little CPUs that they're putting inside the drives are not yet fast enough to do something better. If if you are going to be using, say, a Seagate drive to stop the I, I lost my laptop problem, that's okay. If you are using it to stop a major government, you've caused them a major pain in the neck. They, you know, they will be limited as to what they can pry out of your system. They will still very likely be able to gain a lot of information that will surprise you about it, but they won't be getting necessarily the plain text. You know, if, if you happen to have, oh, you know, XML files, which tend to have the same header, you know, it's going to have the DTD things, they could probably infer which ones on your disk, which blocks all contained at the start of XML files. But they wouldn't know after that what they would be, and, you know, and then they would then start moving from there. So, so yes, they're really nice things. They will be getting better. Consider, again, your threat model. If your threat model is, is I have to stop a major government, then you really want to continue to use a software mechanism. Um, um, in the future, they will be very nice. Those of us who do software are, 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 you know, I'm enthusiastic about it because it means that I'm going to be spending more time doing key management rather than the raw crypto. Yeah, my reaction to encrypting disk drives is, you know, it, what I want to know is after we stop paying Iron Mountain to lose clear text, kip, you know, clear test drives and tape backups and things like that. What are going to happen to the keys? You know, what are you going to do with the key and the disk drive you had five years ago? I mean, hopefully we got some scheme, yeah. so we better get this right. And I understand that we can get the mechanisms right, but then we have to actually execute on it in the real world. My theory is that actually the the, the, the ones that they have lost were in fact never created, and the reason they're lost is they were never created. And that, you know, something goes wrong, like, you know, somebody comes in late or so on, and they say, oh, let's not do today's backup, we'll do tomorrow's backup. No one will know. But, but some... Blame Iron Mountain. It's always good. They're in the press all the time, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah, but, but, but I, 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 no, I, I, view, I, I blame bigger root causes. One of the... Um, I think it was Los Alamos. They, you know, they lost two, two in the government installation, two drives. What actually happened when they did an investigation was that a guy was doing a backup, and he got 13 cartridge drives, and he was going to do the backup, and so he got 13, this is top secret, data labels for them, and it only took 11. And instead of turning the extra two back in, he just threw them away, and so therefore, poof, there were two lost cartridges. And in fact, they weren't lost cartridges. They were cartridges that were never created. 
So you're and saying I, their sticker been, management was better than their key management. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, blame, blame the backup people. Humans will do it. Yeah. Yeah, but still, we got, you know, you pay a gorilla to come in and take your tapes and put them in a warehouse you don't have access to. So, I mean, put things in there with keys, and you got practical issues, I guess. And if you yeah. give the gorilla an empty box and says there are tapes in it, the gorilla will dutifully put the empty box in there. And if you then need to I go recommend find putting the bricks tapes. in it to get the weight right. Yeah. But yeah. 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 Another question. Well, see, you're, you're, you're supposed to have a mm -hmm. Netflix account, the so you can use 27 different movies, well, you know, phrases, so you the can have multiple passphrases. The, 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 the question was, when, when, you know, when you deal with these things, if you have one password or one passphrase or even, you know, one secret that governs all of these other secrets, what happens when that one is done? I mean, that is, in fact, that is, that, is, that is the game that you are playing, whether you are optimizing, whether you're optimizing easy to manage versus secure. The... A, a way that you can think about this is when you're building your defenses, do you want towers or do you want walls? You know, you can't build walls as high as you can build towers. But in many cases, a wall around the city that's, that's five feet tall, even though a person could jump over it, is actually more secure than a whole bunch of 30-foot towers. So, so the, it, it, it does boil, boil down to what are you worried about? And, and reliability aspects of you know cryptography is a really good way to destroy data and you will never get it back so 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 you you know you know you you have to have a w if if you don't care about that data if it is i would rather have that data be gone forever than compromised then lots of keys is a good thing if it's i need to get back to that data then then you want to sacrifice some of the raw security versus the reliability aspects of it. And, you know, those of us who are building these things want to make it a sliding scale and not like, you know, one or zero. We're also not very good about distinguishing between key backup and other things that imply somebody else has a copy of the key, you know, key escrow or whatever you want to use for words. So if we have backup mechanisms for important things like keys, you know, you, you have extra copy of the keys to your car, you know, so, I mean, there are mechanisms you can do, do it safely. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. timing or temperature based attacks the 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 general term for these is what's called side channel attacks that that Paul Kotcher Paul Kotcher started us down this with timing attacks voltage temperature you name it these are in fact the most serious attacks that we have um, there, there are, and they always will be because, because every one of these is going to be that somebody thinks of it after the system was designed and deployed. There, you know, there are all sorts of things that, that, that you will be able to find out. I mean, some of the very interesting ones that are out now are timing based, but they're based upon cache misses. So if you happen to be, say, on the same s same computer with somebody and it's a dual processor system or it's anything where it shares the same cache with the process that's doing crypto you can do things like probe memory and you and you time it with a high resolution clock and you see how fast it does that did, did i did that come back in something i can't measure or was it two microseconds well if it was two microseconds it must have been a cache miss and so you infer from that aha well if that was a cache miss then they hadn't used that piece of memory and a lot, of, a lot of systems are not designed to it. The way, that we saw, the way that we fix a lot of these is, in fact, to slow down the crypto. I guess the... the uh, Absolutely. You're assuming... The, well, if you're looking at something like that, you're trying to the, assume... The, the question was, what was, was um, um, doesn't that assume that you have to be in the system? And the answer is yes, it does assume that, but the PHP web script that you're running is in the same system as the other guy who's doing banking. 
and if you know if you could escalate one of these in, into and nobody's ever done anyone this complex where you had to be running code on there and this is why for example it's really good to isolate the crypto to some places or another is that you know in the worst one is that you could um, um, determine this by by doing something else Dan Bernstein constructed a system where he, you know, he made an easy to break protocol that was a wireless protocol and by talking to the router you could get timing information about the key that was being used for another, for somebody else using the same system and thus deduce what their key was. And he was only doing it by, by essentially pinging the system and he constructed it this way. It's a great proof of concept. It's not been put into the real world, but it shows that you may, you know, you may you may be on the system in ways that you don't that you don't think you are if you have say an encrypting disk drive that is on the same system as something else you could potentially lose the key to the disk by just reading and writing the disk the other thing is timing information the other thing you get is that people don't budget for crypto as something that's a legitimate resource to use so you know, you start to consume more CPU or memory or whatever, and, and then you've got things, side channels that were there, but it's because of bad planning, not because there's anything wrong with the technology. Yeah. Yeah. There are remarkably few real-world attacks with these things, but, 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 but someday someone's going to come up with, uh, with one, and they probably won't tell anyone. Yeah, in the back, there's another question. question is, sort of is about uh, prime factorization. Qu quant yeah, quant yeah, quantum computation, I would say, in general. Well, nobody has yet built a quantum computer. Um, um, D-Wave did something a couple of weeks ago, which, which by their own admission, they said it was an analog computer with quantum elements, that they actually admitted that their own marketing was selling it a little bit more than perhaps it was actually doing. Nobody's built one. And, and there, are, there are smart people who question whether or not it is possible. But, you know, I will also, and, you know, I happen to be one of these people who say, I don't know that it is at all possible that anyone will make a useful quantum computer like ever. On the other hand, you know, Clark's second law is the one about technology and magic. Quark's Clark's first law is that if, if a, an elderly and respected scientist tells you that something is possible, it probably is, but if an elderly and responsible scientist tells you that something is impossible, it's probably wrong. So, you know, you know, I, I, will, na I, you know, I will be a skeptic about my own skepticism, <laughs> that, you know, but, but nobody's done this yet. We have, in some of our ciphers now, hedges against quantum computing. The whole reason why 256-bit crypto exists in AES and other systems is as a hedge against quantum computing. Now, and, and that's because the best guess we have is that it will essentially half the bit length of your keys. So it would make your 128-bit keys as strong with, if there are quantum computers as 64-bit keys were. And so your 256-bit keys would then be as strong as 128-bit ones, and you'd need a whole planet full of computers to break that, and we probably don't have those. So, so that is the, the calculation. Now, we don't know what's going to happen with factorization because there are quantum algorithms for how you would do not only factoring but discrete logs, which is how all of our public key crypto works today, that, that could potentially solve things in reasonable amounts of time. Last summer, Dan Bernstein ran a conference that was the post-quantum computing crypto conference and they were talking about how you would build systems. And it was, let's assume we have quantum computers. What do we do now? And there are, for example, public key crypto systems that you wouldn't want to use today because they take a lot of memory and are slow. But if you had quantum computers, would be not crackable and reasonable to use in time, like, like using things with hash trees and, and, and lattice-based. There are other things that, that, that would work. S fortunately, we're probably going to get warning 
years in advance that there's going to be quantum computation and so we'll gradually migrate things out kind of like we are doing now with hash functions where we're saying uh, guys it would be a good idea to stop using MD5 don't use MD SHA-1 for any new projects and and keep in mind that we haven't designed what you really want to use do you think people can start talking about trying to uh, you know make North Korea stop their research into quantum computing or something like that well well, it's NIST. I mean, you know, NIST is funding both ends of this. <laughs> yeah. Can they be? It was how, well, how you know how well quant how much can quantum if how much could quantum algorithms be parallelized? Well, if Intel started shipping a chip in laptops that, that was a quantum computing chip, it would be parallelized, you know, inherently, because you'd have lots of computers doing this. I think, I, I mean, I am not an expert on this by any means whatsoever. Um, so, you know, I don't know. But, but it, you know, you, you can make reasonable assumptions like that, that there is not, there is not yet any quantum hearing aid. And the reason that I say quantum hearing aid was that within like six months after the first transistor was made, s they made an actual product that was a hearing aid that used a transistor as an amplifier. We have not seen any toy things yet that are quantum computing based that are actually useful. The closest we've seen to it is, in fact, the recent D-Wave thing, where, where we're not exactly sure exactly how much quantum computing was actually in it. Yeah. The question was, if somebody proves the Riemann hypothesis, what does that mean for PKI? And it's too early in the morning. Give me the back no, of the match. Nothing. Riemann. Nothing. Because the Riemann hypothesis is, is, a, is a hypothesis about the, how, how dense prime numbers are. You know, as, as you get bigger and bigger numbers, um, prime numbers get less dense. That's a completely inadequate summarizing of it. I said but back of the matchbook. Yep. Um, but, but we assume that it's true. I mean, there's no reason to think that it isn't true. I mean, you know, you know, a smart betting person bets that it is true, just like a few years ago a smart betting person would have bet that Fermat's last theorem was true. That the interesting result would be that it is false, and that, and that would mean that PKI is stronger than we thought. Yes? Right. Yeah. Paul's saying Paul's saying that it's actually been observed that it that 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 it, that it is computationally true out to gazillions, you know, beyond the blades of grass example. So so you know you can assume that it is true that that it will be it will be if it is false it is false in the unuseful numbers. Yeah, and that and that was that was also true, say for for Fermat's last theorem where before it was proved we knew that it was true for everything up to like you know you know two to the gazillionth well, I'm just mistaken in thinking that it's proved with predictability it wouldn't no no because all it tells you about is the is the density of them and 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 it would actually it would we assume right now that it is true so, so, so um, proving that our assumption is true doesn't hurt us. Proving that our assumption was false actually would make us better off. And I'm going to move from there to one of my things, which is, ooh, it just went by. What about elliptic curve cryptography? Because it's, because it's very closely related to this thing. Elliptic curve cryptography is discrete log cryptography, which is the Elgamal, DSA, et cetera family, but not done on the integers, done on this other line, as it were, this other set. The advantage of it is that as you deal with prime numbers, they get less dense out so far, the further out you go. If you want to have 
a public key, well, a 1024-bit public key, according to NIST, is about as strong as an 80-bit symmetric key. And a 2,000-bit public key is about as strong as, as, as triple DES. That a 3,000-bit one is about as strong as 128-bit numbers. But if you want to be as strong as, as a 256-bit, AES-256, you have to get out to like a 15,000-bit one. And nobody wants to be doing public keys that are that big. So the reason why elliptic curve cryptography is interesting is in fact to get what's called crypto balance between, between all parts of the system. Because you don't, you know, a good attacker will attack whatever is the weakest part of the system. So if the public key, if you are using AES-256 with a 100, with a 1024-bit PGP key, the smart attacker will go after your public key. Well, actually, the smart attacker will go after your passphrase. But, you know, <laughs> But, but they'll go after the public key before they go after the AES-256. Similarly, right now, even if you're using 4,000-bit public keys, that is the weak point of your system. And, and elliptic curve cryptography would let us get balance back into the system. The biggest problem right now is that, that, that there is a patent minefield around elliptic curve cryptography. So it's effectively... You, you affect, uh, uh, people who wouldn't, who wouldn't mind buying a patent would use it, and people who either are too cheap or were I scarred mean, by RSA or have some alleged business reason will try to do it for free. When, when, when in, in PGP, several years ago, we built an elliptic curve system that we're pretty darn sure does not infringe on any of the important patents. And it was, it was actually built in about 2000. And we never shipped it. Um, you know, if, 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 you go, if you go download the PGP source code, you will see stubs for the elliptic curve stuff because we don't, we, we, don't, you know, we don't publish that part of the code because we aren't using it. And we never shipped it because there was no clear benefit to anyone who was a user for using the elliptic curve cryptography except for crypto balance. And, and it would cause incompatibilities throughout the system. You would have to have, you know, if somebody made a public key that was an ECC key, other people couldn't use it unless they were ECC. So, you know, you end up with these software deployment issues rather than crypto issues. <coughs> and then the um, allied governments, because, you know, it was, it, was, it was the U.S. government that started this, but I've had other governments that I've talked to say, we think ECC is a good idea, too, who've said that they want to go to this. And um, they're interested in going to it in the long term, where you know, the long term would be in the next five to 15 years. They, they really want us by the time that we get to 2020 to 2025 to not be using this integer stuff anymore because, because they'd rather be using the, the ECC stuff. But, but they're starting now because they, they know that it takes a long time to make such a radical change because you would ba basically have to change every public key that there is. Yeah, assuming you stick with the current P PKI system, it's, you know, it's, like, it's kind of interesting. Does it, does it matter? I, I can't generate a cert request with IIS for one of these things, and I can't buy a certificate from VeriSign or GoDaddy that uses mm -hmm. elliptic curve, so mm -hmm. it must not be real yet. Yes, um, Roger well, at first. Certicom. Mostly Certicom. Roger. Ooh, 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 Roger. Oh, gosh, what a great softball. Thank you. He asked, <laughs> could, tell, tell us about the AT&T NSA thing. Um, this cuts very closely into the can governments crack crypto. I believe that what is going on is that they're doing traffic analysis. That, that where I'll define traffic analysis as being non-crypto breaking, that you look, at, you look at the actual traffic that people are doing and you infer things about it. The, the interesting thing about traffic analysis is that it is extraordinarily powerful and it is extraordinarily hard to protect against because the main way that you protect against it is by not talking. And systems so, are great at leaking signal even so, when using crypto. So if all you know is what phone numbers are calling what other phone numbers and timing and duration information, you can start constructing really interesting maps and start and start 
um, um, making interesting deductions from that, particularly if you know that you know this phone number is owned by a bad guy, this phone number is owned by somebody that, that we have a 50% chance is a bad guy. You, know, you start making these inferences and you start looking at these maps and you can do things. Um, there's a fellow at University of, of Texas, Ricardo Batati, who's done some amazing things where he has taken an IPsec tunnel and demultiplexed it where he can tell you what is the HTTP traffic, what is the FTP traffic, what is the VoIP traffic, what's what's other unclassifiable UDP, and this is and this is only by essentially counting the packet, packet zero time t, packet one time t two, and all he does is look at this and he can tell he can demultiplex the things. He can do on a on a wireless on a wireless router, um, reasonable geolocation by just timing when the packets are coming through. Yeah, if if you take, you know, if you're a, your average enterprise user and you take your laptop with the giant bright orange asset tag on the back cover and you walk into a Starbucks and, you know, outside Torcon and you start your laptop and you send an email to your girlfriend with your 3072 bit RSA key uh, while your iTunes client is coming up and your BitTorrent client is coming up and you're using dodgeball on your phone to tell all your hacker friends you're in town you want to go to parties then it's got nothing to do with the crypto. Um, right. I mean you're, you know you're going to light up. Yep. Um, The question is, does increasing bandwidth mean that the arguments for ECC are, 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 are effectively moot? I mean, I think that's a good summary of it. Uh, bandwidth isn't really the issue because it's not really the size, it's the computation length that it would take for these very long keys. Um, um, for example, when I build servers that do crypto, I'm looking at, for example, how many millions of messages that they can do per day. And, and, that, and you know, still, I can chew up nearly infinite quantities of computation by doing signatures, regening keys, redoing, redoing things. So, so faster crypto is better. Now, elliptic curve is interesting in that naive implementations of elliptic curve are not faster than the integer stuff and may even be slower and all of the patents are around the speed ups. The, 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 the interesting thing about, about elliptic curve, unlike the previous patents around, around, int around public key cryptography, is that the previous patents were on the actual algorithms themselves, you know, Diffie-Hellman, RSA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the, Im and the implementations were essentially open. The core math is open in elliptic curve. It's the speed ups. That are all, that all have intellectual property around them, so so and that that was, for example, one of the reasons why we never released before it became trendy elliptic curve, even though it was cool, was that if we if we wanted something to be intellectual property free, it would have to be a reasonably naive implementation, which means that it wouldn't be that much faster. I mean, a 30% speed up is not a good reason to change the infrastructure. And then more losses possibly still take well, yep. the other thing about the crypto stuff is that. People build crypto chips as a boutique business. If Intel built crypto chips the way they build processors, you could, you could do real-time RSA on disk drives, and we, we wouldn't be having ECB conversations. Um, so, th but they don't put money into the smaller gates and the faster processors and all that. So we still have uh, resource barriers, and so things like elliptic curve become interesting. Paul, you had a question in the back again. Okay. Okay. I didn't understand this question that's been flashing up on the screen about who we have to kill in order to be king. Okay. What's that? What are you talking about? EKE. EKE. Yeah. There, there, are, there are a family of authentication systems that, that, that are, that, you know, because there's 
speak and eek and this and that, and they're all patented. The answer to that question is they're all patented. There, there are people who have started to do some of them. I saw somebody at RSA this year who was doing speak yeah. as an authentication mechanism. Yes, it's it's exactly goes back to the original Bellevue. No, no, like yeah, well, 92, 93, he was saying, uh, well, patents are 20 years from filing, so you know um, uh, that means that probably 2010 to 2015 we'll see them expire. Um, no, that's patent, yeah, but if they patent they patented it at approximately that time, I mean, if they patented it in in the early 90s, then you would expect in the early 20 20 teens that the patents would expire. Or someone will get smart and license them cheaply. It's a patent yeah. issue. It is a completely a patent issue. So when you know when the drunken Englishman you know wasn't throwing up and, and wrote that <laughs> question for us, you know he lives he lives in a, those mystical his, lands it beyond it the waters where we can't patent math mathematics and gravity and all these other things that aren't really inventions. No. Let's see. Anybody? EV certs. So, are oh, yeah. EV certs trustable? Yeah. So, uh, back at the dawn of the internet, uh, there was this company called VeriSign, which only did public key cryptography back in the old days. And their business model was somebody died and made them God, and so they could sell you certs, and you had to trust the certs because the trust you bought trust from them. Um, and you know they get things right and wrong, and eventually they buy cell phone billing companies and the internet domain system and managed services and various other things. And now there's this big conglomerate called VeriSign, which wants to sell you a new brand of certificate, which uh, because there's 200 roots in the browsers and who knows it whether we should trust them. It makes them. the little green bar light up. The little green seven. bar will light up and it will enhance the user experience. And this is the well, important part, it's well, the user experience. Yeah, the, 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 the problem was that, that this will have to be the last one, I just got yep. the time signal, that, that in the old days, they checked everything when you bought a certificate for SSL. You know, they'd want to see your incorporation papers and blah 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 blah. blah. Well, it, well, you had, you know, this doesn't scale. And now you need a pulse and so an email address. I if you can, if you can respond to an email from at hostmaster at domain X, if you can hijack a domain for long enough that you can get an email for hostmaster, you can buy a cert for that domain. So the idea is, let's come up with these extended validation certs that really then cause you to run through the ringers. For the next while, they'll be good. You will be able to trust them more. But they are essentially just gold-plated bits. You can buy a 10-year-old Jeep or you can buy a brand new Escalade. You so know, doesn't so really change it. the minute that, say, the mob sets up a shell company with a Delaware, or with a Delaware lawyer who will respond to incorporation papers, they'll get, then get a gold-plated cert, and they'll be just as good as anything else. So they will be good until that happens. And and when that happens, they won't be good anymore because it is it is all a process thing, not a crypto thing. And I believe then that we must yeah because yeah, we got like two minutes. So thank you very much. <laughs> Nothing. The uh, you have to pop the browser far enough to get the visual effect. Oh. And they claim IE7 is not poppable.